Hello everyone, um, I'm Hermione, this is Ed, and we're here to talk about per metrics. So uh, Mark invited us along because, like Product Health, we were shortlisted for the Innovate UK competition. Um, and unlike Product Health, we are at a somewhat earlier stage in the uh, life cycle of a startup. We're in fact about nine months old. Um, and I've met enough of you to know about your interest in commercial, commercial applications of IoT. We wanted to share a little bit about what we've learnt in nine months of bootstrapping an IoT company. So, um, one of the nicest things I think about the Internet of Things is the opportunity to take something that is intrinsically a bit dull and turn it into something rather sexier using the Internet. So, to use an example, a thermometer will give you reluctantly a single piece of data. Now, if you add location and you add time to that and you present it in an engaging manner on the internet, you can turn that data into information. You can create commercially valuable knowledge. You can use that knowledge to generate alerts. If you repeat, see repeating patterns of knowledge over time, you can automate that into data products. So the big picture behind PER, what we're trying to do is we're seeing value in combining spatial um, information and data flows to manage um, devices better. Now there are already companies, um, for example Esri in France and Skyhook in the US, who are using um, spatial information to drive IoT applications in smart cities, in mobile marketing for example. Um, we're pioneering the use of spatial information at a much higher resolution. Plans really, not maps. And we're starting with temperature because that is a metric that is, has got a lot of value attached to it. There will be other metrics in the pipeline, but at the moment, temperature is where it's at. So you might well ask, what can we do with this information that's valuable? <laughs> um, and a little bit of, well, quite a lot of work on customer discovery over the past nine months um, has raised a couple of key markets for us. Um, first one of which is, is office management. Now, if you are an office or facilities manager in an, an SME and you want to do something about your energy costs, um, you're probably well advised to start with your HVAC. It's 30 to 40 percent of the costs in a typical um, uh, office setup. Um, but the problem is with HVAC that it's not typically a set and forget sort of exercise. Um, it'll drift over time. People will fiddle with a the thermostat people will leave the AC on in meeting rooms when they're not there or leave it on overnight. People will open windows when the heating's on. Um, so essentially, as a, as, a, as a facilities manager, you need to have some degree of monitoring all the time to continue to make your, the reductions you need to make. Of course, there's an absolute metric ton of um, building management systems out there that could track this sort of thing. but. Actually, for um, an office manager and SME, most of them are they're complex, they're over-engineered, they cost a bomb, they require a professional fit, you've got to talk to your landlord about it. There's all sorts of reasons why a busy office manager is actually just not that interested in engaging with a BMS. And what we wanted to do was to generate a solution for people in that position. Okay, and there's another set of challenges. Um, which is potentially even more valuable in data centres. Now, obviously, these are very well-monitored environments, but actually they're mostly well-monitored at aisle level or zone level. Um, every hosting company I spoke, talk to, every sysadmin acknowledges that within data centres, hotspots do occur, and these create costs. You know, you have to design in redundancy. Um, you see hard disk failure rates go up. You, you get server performance affected, Worst case scenario is that you get an unpredicted failure, and obviously that's expensive. So um, a little case study for you. Um, we've been piloting surfs per on some servers for Mythic Beasts. Um, for those of you who don't know Mythic Beasts, they're a local hosting company with a very well-deserved reputation for great intelligent service. They're the guys who kept Raspberry Pi's site up and running while RS Component and Farnell's site went down due to the volume of demand on the initial launch. So working with Mythic Beast, there's, we've seen there's a couple of key ways that they are using PER for, to generate some value. Um, firstly, they're using it to audit the performance of their data centers um, and to make sure that it's staying within the service level agreements that they have. 
And now they're looking at using it um, to monitor conditions for their customers' hardware um, and to get insights into what, you know, what the rate of disk failures might be and whether they're related. Other common problems we hear from uh, data center users. Um, they can't get sufficient density in some racks because if they pack them out, it'll cause uh, failing, failures related to thermal, um, thermal problems. Or that actually they never get any warning of a cooling problem um, and it, until the performance has suffered. Um, and that last one is actually a great example of why the spatial dimension is quite important. A lot of sysadmins have <coughs> data temperature from the onboard um, sensors in servers or switches. Um, but what they can't do, or not without a great deal of racking their brains, is put that, spa that, uh, that data into a spatial dimension. And that's where you get the interesting patterns or the useful patterns for starting to predict and analyze what's going on. Right, well, in practical terms, these two markets share some common features um, which are driving the solution that we're building. Um, it needs to be trivial to retrofit. I mean, we're talking minutes, not hours, um, and, you know, frankly, somebody licks spanners can probably do it. Um, you need to be able to understand the most important insights very quickly. Um, it, you know, we've obviously got users in these two markets with a wide range of technical expertise, but they're all busy people and they don't want to have to dig for data unless they have a particular interest in being data geeks. Um, on top of that, you need configurable alerts because obviously you need to actually deliver time-sensitive um, problems into people's inboxes or uh, by SMS. Um, you, of course, need to keep the data secure and confidential. Um, and importantly, this needs to be a platform upon which we can build more sophisticated data analytics as we go along. Um, for example, correlations between frequent transient excursions out of temperature and hard disk failure. And this is what it looks like in a pilot. Um, so installing this was a matter of hooking these we call these kittens, by the way. Do you want to start handing those round? They've round. got tails, but they're not mice. Um, <laughs> hooking those to the uh, rack door, um, and then providing power and uh, Ethernet connection to that gateway. Um, the gateway instantly starts to upload data to the, onto the plan on the web account, which gives you a graph view and a heat map. Now, this is the data from one of these Mythic Beast installs that we were talking about earlier. And actually, it's, it's quite a nice one because um, a week after we installed this, we got ah, a different one. Yeah. <laughs> Ed's thrown me by putting in something different. You can see quite clearly on one of the other ones that I think that a week after we put it in, we actually got a, an interesting. Um, Curve. This front one is the, in, is the input inlet, and the back there is, is the exhaust. And what we started to see was that the middle section of the inlet went up way out over 30 degrees, so it was well out of SLA, and it remained that way for about a week. Um, now, the chances are that's the result of problems in, in the pressure in the air conditioning, um, but in any event, it was well outside the service level agreement so that, that, with the data centre. Um, it's not the only feature that we picked up in a couple of months of monitoring, and if anybody wants to have a look and have a chat about what else we can see, then come and have a talk afterwards. So, as per Lean Startup, um, if every startup is a collection of hypotheses, um, what were our hypotheses um, nine months ago? And really, have any of them stood the test of time? Well, back in the summer, our roadmap was to bootstrap um, around the belief that we'd be able to sell uh, a solution to consumers at around £150 in sort of smart home type space. And we could make revenue from uh, sale of the hardware and possibly also from uh, a web-based service. Today, after uh, quite a lot of customer discovery work, um, we're still focused on bootstrapping, um, and Ed will talk a bit more about that um, and why that is. Um, we're still focused on creating a single product, uh, but we've found higher margin applications in the uh, B2B space. So we've also got beta systems deployed in pilots at the moment. We've got more pilots in the pipeline. Um, and in response to market demand, we're preparing to scale some manufacturing. 
Now, I'm going to hand over to Ed at this point. He wants to talk a little bit about some of the um, lessons that we've learned um, uh, on the more the hardware side. Okay. Um, I hope the kittens are going around. Um, we'll have a look at see who's got the hottest hands when we get to the end of the presentation. Perhaps. <laughs> Maybe if the technology works. So. Um, ah, let's just. There you go. So I um, just. Before I sort of dive into some of the technical things that we've been up to and some of the, um, the business challenges and how we're meeting them, um, I just want, uh, I wanted to say a couple of things about philosophy of why we're doing uh, bootstrap, why we're doing lean, what we're trying to do in the Internet of Things. Um, I, I have a personal view that the Internet of Things is absolutely rammed full of little companies doing, making shovels for a gold rush that's not really happened yet. And so my belief... Um, with that is that um, there's value in using some of that stuff, working with some of those technologies, and trying to pilot and pioneer a business that actually does make things that uses Internet of Things technology to deliver real value to people. And I'm not prepared to wait around for every, everybody to make their devices available to me. I think that the way I've got to do that is to actually generate some Internet things that generate the data for me and that leads me to a belief that I've got to generate Internet things at the lowest possible cost point and to feed data in the most efficient way back so that I can most readily develop value on the basis of that data and deliver back business value as in the ways that Hermione's been describing. So that's sort of a little bit about the philosophy of you know, what we're trying to do as a company, perhaps. So um, moving on from there, um, Hermione used a phrase a little bit earlier about making simple things sexy. I do think that this is what the Internet of Things can do. There are very many things that have been done in very simple ways and very cheaply in the past, but if we mix in a bit of Internet technology to those, we can create some far more valuable systems and products. We can take simple things like batteries and turn them into intelligent energy delivery systems that are reliable for people, more reliable than a grid connection. So I... Um, what we're trying to do in the first instance is take something, something extraordinarily simple, like a temperature measurement, but by rolling it together with some really good technology that's been pushed very hard in the software-as-a-service space and the Internet space, rolling it together with those big data systems, with really good um, user interface stuff and really good web technology, we can pull these pieces of data together and use the spatial mix that we mix in with the data to generate real knowledge about whether the air is, airflow is going through a rack in the right direction or when someone's misadjusted that thermostat. And that way, we can deliver value in those alerts to give money back to people as quickly as possible. Okay, so um, because this is a make space um, setup, I thought I'd set myself up as a hostage to fortune and tell you a bit about making things. Um, this is probably going to be a disaster. So if you all know a lot more than I do, then please come back later and tell me where I'm getting it wrong. But this is just a little bit about... Um, where if you come from my kind of background, which is about professional engineering and doing big systems for big companies and doing um, high-value consulting work and massive-scale things, you have to change your mindset to do a bootstrap, lean, Internet of Things company. You have to read a few of the books of the key, cool guys who have done a bit of it, who are much younger than you. So anyway, here are some <laughs> of the things that, um, that we've been doing. Um, these are my giant killers. This is my three slides of giant killers. Um, if you're going to do stuff like we're doing, which is in radio space, and you want to do stuff which has got a lot of analysis in it, you'd always have to use MATLAB. You don't use MATLAB anymore. Everyone should use IPython. It's fantastic, and it's better. Um, PCB design. If you're doing it professionally, you're probably using Altium. You might be using Mentor Graphics if you're unlucky. Um, but the tools these days are starting to get absolutely phenomenal. So... If you want to use Spice, there's no need to go and use Spice in a professional package. You can use free packages, and it's the same code doing the analysis. Use LT Spice. DipTrace is my current favorite um, low-cost PCB design package. It's probably going to get bought out by someone very, very rich very soon. It'll become expensive, as they will do. But this is the only one that really I find to be extremely pro productive in terms of online design rule checking and and pushing multi-layer designs very quickly. So it's quite capable of doing RF design. We do a bit of RF design. It works fine. You don't need to go and use Altium to do RF design. Uh, so that's the next giant killer. 
Um, prototyping and building things, we've done lots of things with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and they're great. So um, this is our first kitten prototype. As you can see, it wouldn't really fit in your hand in the same way as the little ones do. And it is an Arduino with a radio module and a temperature sensor and some calibration and some magic. stuff. Yeah. Magic. Um, the second one's an Arduino as well. It's just a Pro Mini. So it's can we make it at the right power consumption at the right sort of towards the right size? So you can't do the power consumption on the big one, but you can do the power consumption on a Pro Mini. And then the next one is taking the chipset and putting it on our own PCB with a radio module. And the next one along is the full custom one, and the one beyond that is the one in your hands. So in our nine months, we've done about five revisions of Kitten uh, prototyping and development, and each one of those has built more and more knowledge and more technology and capability and software, you know, nice, niceness into the, the Kitten. So my final uh, giant killer slide is just about mechanical design. It might take you a little bit of time to get your head around, but you can do a lot of the things you can do with SolidWorks without using SolidWorks or Pro Engineer. SketchUp is really good if you keep trying at it. It does really, really <laughs> clever things if you keep. If you, it's just about working out how to do it. And then if you take tools like Blender, you can create very good uh, design, uh, um, manufacturing data that you can send out to people for rapid prototyping, or you can, um, or you can get tools made. So in, in our stuff, we're, we're currently at uh, paid customer trials level. All of our mechanical stuff is rapid prototyped. Um, and my favorite guys at the moment are 3D Print UK, which do a cubic centimeter for 10p. And it comes back in three days. So why would you buy a 3D printer when people do stuff like that? So that's my, um, how we do it. As I say, come back later and tell me where I got it wrong. Um, so moving on from there. Obviously, in what we're doing, there's a supply chain element. We need to make stuff. I, mean, it, I think 10 years ago, if you'd said, uh, stood up in front of a group of people in a room like this or anywhere and said, um, we're going to bootstrap a company that makes stuff and sells it to people, they'd have gone, so where are you going to get your 100 grand for tooling? Where are you going to, how are you going to engage with a manufacturer to get that first tranche of stuff done? And I think that there are some misconceptions in this space, and, and perhaps... Uh, you know, I'm, I might not be the only person in the room to realize this, but it's quite possible to take an idea and a hardware design and take it through stages of scaling and actually make things that you can give to people and that you can sell to people without getting on an airplane and going to China and trying to negotiate a contract with a Chinese manufacturer and waiting three months for your container load of stuff to come back and then discover it's wrong. So um, I've got a slide here just which is covered in stuff, and perhaps I should publish this one um, if anybody would like to see it afterwards. But this afternoon, I just tried to get down what the stages are that a bootstrap company can go through to get things from small volume into higher volume. So it's basically... The interesting thing is that there are so many companies who would really like to be Foxconn making laptops for Apple, and many of them are very small. So there's a lot of people out there who are keen to help you manufacture small volumes so that they can help you being build into a bigger company. So you have PCB manufacturers who are keen to do board stuffing for you and will do it at ridiculously cheap rates. Uh, you have the sort of next tier up people who will take manufacturing data and help you build, you know, box build <coughs> you know, thousands of things to very high quality to test specifications with testing. And then even the big guys want to talk to you because they have factories in Europe and in the UK even, j and the Flextronics. And the way they get their high-volume stuff into manufacturing in China is not by dropping it straight into China. It's by piloting small things in economies like ours. So it's not a problem if, you've got, if you're starting to sell things to people, I mean, just starting to sell a few things to people, to phone up the really big guys and say, right, I'm starting to sell a few things to people. We're seeing some demand. What's it going to take for me to set up a pilot manufacture in Sunderland or in Hungary? And you can do that, and that, that, that's not a plane trip, and it's also not a three-month container ride for your goods to come back to discover they're wrong. So manufacturing is scalable, and it does allow you to start out a business at a very small scale and grow at large, I believe. Okay. okay. Um, I, this was the one I, I wanted to bring along for a bit of a debate, I suppose. I hope some people in the room have some opinions about this as well. Again, um, in a traditional 
technology-based business, the most important thing you do on day one is file your patent. Because on day two, you're going to phone up your investors. And the first thing they're going to ask you is, what's your intellectual property position? I don't think we're in that game. Um, we certainly need to protect our designs and our products. Uh, we need to protect our position because we're going to invest in you know, business creation activities and customers. And we do want patents, but I don't want to end up in a litigation case with a patent. My purpose for having a patent has got is nothing to do with protecting stuff in that old old sense. So I think one of the very interesting things about Internet of Things businesses is that the thing that makes the product sexy is actually the Internet piece. It's not the technology, you know, hardware piece. That piece should be as simple as you can make it because you don't want trouble with that bit. It should be in the Internet piece. And the Internet piece is almost self-protecting because you're setting up a service. The reason your customers come to you is because your service is good. Your hardware is all using your service, but in a secure way. You know, you, your hardware is designed, it's not going to work with anybody else's service. Your service isn't going to work with anyone else's hardware unless you want to make that into a business stream as well. So you already have some protection of your, your business position. And that is so much stronger and so much easier to um, look after than trying to push a whole lot of effort into developing patents and, and pushing patents through a, a, a process. There is a place for some patents. It's worth having a few, but it shouldn't be the primary protection. Um, so that's the debate one. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we can talk about that later. Um, Excuse me. Then the sort of final one. Um, so uh, I think, I believe this, the sensible wisdom is that um, you should never try and hog the cake. What you should try and do is share with investors your really nice birthday cake. You should... You should take your, your fair slice of it, let them be part of it, and then they can take three quarters of the cake, but you get a quarter of a much bigger cake. You know, that's the traditional why you should get investors in. I think um, I like a lot of the ideas around Lean Startup. I, Eric Ries' book is great. Um, there's an awful lot of other really good reading around the subject. My reasons for not, taking, not looking to take large funding quickly are less to do with that cake argument. I mean, that's the argument that's played to us. But it's because when we're building a small business, the last thing we want to be doing is spending all our time fundraising. Fundraising doesn't actually generate business unless you find a very specific and unique kind of funder, backer, someone who's able to buy your product, or help, help you sell your product. But <coughs> otherwise, it's just a big distraction. Those funds that you're taking in are, are actually a loan. You will have to repay them. You, know, you will have to return the money to those investors. And that means that they will have an interest in how the business is steered. And they will make decisions that are not necessarily best, best based on the best interests of the business about how you operate the business in the future. So if you do find that um, it's getting to be a bit heavy water selling temperature monitoring systems to people's homes, there's too many consumers out there. If your investors have put the money in because they like that idea and that's the thing that they think is going to be really big, they're going to be really upset when you come back and say, well, actually, we're going to do data centers this week because it's actually really hot and it's working. So fundraising does have a place. Um, I think the, thing, the, the big thing I'm anti on fundraising is taking money to help us do technical or market de-risking because that's the kind of thing we do. We're technical people. We should be doing the technical de-risking with our money, perhaps, if necessary. And the same with market development. The things we can't do are really about enabling that rapid ramp up when the, once the market has been established and discovered, once the product has been demonstrated to work. And I believe that's the point at which fundraising becomes essential and useful. And that's the point at which, hopefully, if you've got a pro proven product that's working, you don't end up in a massive, long, extended fundraising discussion because there's any argument about whether there's a value in what you're doing. Anyway, so that's my um, fundraising too early is very wasteful, I believe. And that's why we're holding on as tightly as we can to bootstrapping our little company. But we're already getting into um, paid customer trials. So I think it's working OK. It can be done. It's great. Unfortunately, it's getting a little bit bigger than we were planning it to be at this stage. So um, yeah. I don't know. We could do with a bit of help as well. Exactly. So anyway, that's what Permetrix is. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to have a quick look at the... Uh... Um, yeah, the
Um, sorry, let's just see if any see of things happened. See if anything this worked. Um, so which one? So we've been sitting in make space for the last um, uh, hour or so. It's just uh, so this is uh, this is our dashboard. We've got a whole lot of kittens. Some of the kittens have been passed around. Um, it's been gathering data. Oh, there were some very cool people in the room by the yeah. look of things. I did warm these two up beforehand, so they were, um, yeah. But in, so over the last hour or so, we've been tracking the room, and we can heat map it and show you where the warmest place to be is. Or um, the coolest place to be. By the door is pretty hot, by the look of it. You might want to move away from there, and it's pretty cool up this end of the room. That's Mark. Mark always <laughs> generates heat. Anyway. <laughs> So, so that's what our dashboard does, and of course that plugs us into alerts and alarms and sending text messages to people and, and those kinds of things. Okay. There we go.